Vice Chancellor University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Yang berbahagia Datuk Ayar Dr. Haji Ahmad Zaidi Naidin, Vice President Academy of Sciences Malaysia. Mr. Uwe Morawitz, Chairman of the International Peace Foundation. Yang berbahagia Professor Datuk Muhammad Abdul Razak, Deputy Vice Chancellor Research and Innovation, UKM. Yang berbahagia, Profesor Datuk Dr. Sharifah Hapsa, Syed Hassan Shahbuddin, Knight Chancellor, University Kebangsaan Malaysia, Profesor Dr. Roger Conberg, Nobel Laureate, Yang berbahagia, Datuk I.R. Haji Ahmad Zaidi Laidin, Vice President, Academy of Sciences Malaysia, Mr. Uwe Morawitz, Chairman, International Peace Foundation, Yang berbahagia, Profesor Datuk Dr. Muhammad Abdul Razak, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Research and Innovation, UKM. Good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning and thank you for gracing this morning's occasion. Professor Kornberg, Mr. Morawitz, Yang berbahagia Datuk Ayar, Dr. Haji Ahmad Zaini Laidi. Welcome to University Kebangsaan Malaysia. It is indeed our pleasure to welcome you to our beautiful campus in conjunction with the Malaysian Bridges Program. To begin this morning's program, I would like to invite our guests to sit back and view a short video on the activities and achievements of University Kebangsaan Malaysia.
As mentioned earlier, Professor Kornberg is in Malaysia as part of the Malaysian Bridges Program. This program involves the participation of Nobel laureates and is organized by the International Peace Foundation in collaboration with the Academy of Sciences Malaysia and public Malaysian universities. I would like to now invite Mr. Uwe Morawitz, Chairman of the International Peace Foundation, to say a few words. Events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners, including the country's major universities. And I would like to thank the University of Pakistan, Malaysia and its Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. 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 Sharif Sayed Hafsad Shahabudi, for hosting our event today. Having started in November 2008, Bridges is being continuously held in Malaysia and Thailand until April 2009 involving the participation of Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics. The second ASEAN series of bridges is an independent contribution to the decade for a culture of peace and nonviolence, initiated, initiated and promoted by the United Nations General Assembly. It follows the bridges series, which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in Thailand and the Philippines since 2003. The pluralistic program on bridges highlights the International Peace Foundation's intercultural and transdisciplinary approach towards peace. The foundation does not take sides, but acts as a mediator by creating an independent platform for dialogue where representatives of science, politics, economy, culture, religion, the media, and youth can meet, share their viewpoints, listen to each other, and find mutual ways of understanding and cooperation. Therefore, the foundation itself is a bridge and a facilitator between different language groups in our divided societies, where politicians speak another language than artists, and business and religious leaders another one than scientists. In a highly interdependent world, problems cannot be solved by either one of these language groups only, but by finding ways of working together. After the success of its bridges programs in Thailand and the Philippines, the International Peace Foundation has been invited by other ASEAN countries to build further bridges towards peace and international understanding by expanding its program in Southeast Asia to stimulate the intellectual, scientific, and cultural exchange in the region. The second ASEAN Bridges series therefore continuously takes place in Malaysia and Thailand from November 2008 to April 2009, comprising events with Nobel laureates from all fields. The Nobel laureates will visit the region not all at once, but separately to conduct public lectures, seminars, workshops, and dialogues hosted by local institutions during a continued period of six months. The aim of Bridges is to facilitate and strengthen dialogue and communication between societies in Southeast Asia with their multiple cultures and faiths, as well as with peoples in other parts of the world to promote understanding and trust. The events aim at building bridges through Nobel laureates with local universities and other institutions in Southeast Asia to establish long-term relationships which may result in common research programs and other forms of collaboration. By enhancing science, technology, and education as a basis for peace and development, the events may lead to a better cooperation for the advancement of peace, freedom, and security in the region with the active involvement of the young generation, ASEAN's key to the future. This is why Bridges is not designed as a one-time event, but as a continuing process of synergies to make a series of events a sustainable success for Malaysia 
and for Southeast Asia as a whole. I am grateful to the Malaysian Honorary Chairman of Bridges, His Royal Highness Raja Nasrin Shah, and to our Chairman Tun Musahitam. Their powerful guidance paved the way for Bridges to bear fruit. I'm also grateful to the representatives of our local partner institutions who have developed a detailed schedule of the events and continuous meetings, as well as to our sponsors who have enabled us to make bridges a reality. I would like thank you, I would like to say thank you for to everyone present today for taking part in this program. May it help us to facilitate a new culture of peace through dialogue transcending its definition as merely the absence of war or armed conflict into a new understanding of what the basis for peace is, education. In this spirit, we welcome today the 2006 Nobel Laureate for Chemistry, Professor Roger Ponder, who has agreed to come to Malaysia to support the events. We all look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribution to build bridges. Call upon Yang Bahagir, Dr. I.R. Dr. Haji Ahmad Zaidi Laidin, Vice President of the Academy of Sciences for Asia. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Professor Roger Conberg. Nobel Laureate 2006 in Chemistry, <coughs> our special guest speaker. Young Bahia Professor at the Dr. Sharifa Hapsa, Vice Chancellor, University of Bangsa and Malaysia. His Excellency Dr. Daniel Tuskoy, Ambassador of Australia and uh, Austria. Mr. Huey Morales, Chairman of the International Peace Foundation. The management and academies of the UKM, fellows of the academy, I see a couple here, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Academy of Sciences Malaysia, I am indeed honored to say a few words on this occasion. Let me first begin by saying that the Malaysian Bridges series of events is a remarkable series. It provides a platform to hear from an impressive array of speakers, ranging from Nobel laureates, as has been mentioned earlier, in physics, chemistry, medicine, and so on, as well as world-renowned artists and several prominent international personalities. And with this program, so far, we had two Nobel laureates, uh, one in physics and one in economics, by my count. Uh, Mr. Oui Morales says two just now. I said the third. It is already the third. And I was privileged to attend all the three of these uh, speeches by the Nobel Laureates. Ladies and gentlemen, the Academy of Sciences Malaysia considers hosting Professor Roger Conber a tremendous honor, particularly since we also had the privilege of hosting his late father. Nobel Laureate, Professor Arthur Conberg, in 2002. As you already know, perhaps, that uh, Professor Roger Conberg's father, Arthur Conberg, himself won a Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1959. And I was told that uh, Professor Roger Conberg was there to see his father receiving this honor 47 years earlier. They have etched their names in history as one of the sixth ever father-son pair to win a Nobel Prize. And for us in Malaysia, this is the first. <laughs> but he doesn't stop there. His family, his mother was also a scientist. His brother is also a scientist. And uh, even the youngest brother is an architect, apparently, specializes in design 
of biomedical and biotechnical building laboratories in the United States. Although not quite, you know, as an architect, is still involved in biomedical and biotechnology. On behalf of the Academy of Sciences, I also wish to take this opportunity to convey our sincere appreciation to the International Peace Foundation, particularly Mr. Ovi Morawitz, for facilitating this series of events, and everyone else have contributed one way or another to make this series possible. And this time, a special thank you to our host, University of Bangsara, for your kind collaboration, partnership, and commitment. I must say, uh, Vice Chancellor, coming here is a special occasion for me because several years ago, and that shows how old I am, I was involved in the early group that put up a paper to establish this university. And uh, it was all started from the Dewan Bahasa. Perhaps uh, not many realize that. Um, the late Tu Nase, that's like Nase, was uh, uh, instrumental in this. And that initial paper said University Bahasa Kebangsaan, <laughs> not University Kebangsaan. So I think for the information of Professor Conberg, what we actually saw on the video. There was the uh, English words that were taken out and the Malay words putting in. And that was a very, uh, to me, special message. Because trying to make the Bahasa Melayu, the Malay language, a language of learning. Congratulations on that excellent video and presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, frankly, the more I attend this lecture series, the more I learned, and the more I want to attend. And uh, the relevance is clear, because given the challenges of globalization, the present problems related to climate change, the rapid decline in the quality of environment, the depletion of natural resources, and the increasing pressure to meet basic human needs such as food, water, and energy in a sustainable manner, clearly indicates that something has got to be done. More than that, peace is not just about absence of war. What we are finding out is that peace means a lot more to me. It means the well-being of society, the continued sustainable well-being of society. Adequate and continued supply of food and comfort. Safety in all aspects of the world. Slope failure can cause a lot of problems, not just to the houses and the dwellers, but we also notice there's also a breakdown in law and people started to pilfer and so on. This certainly does not constitute peace in my book. Tsunami is another great tragedy that affected many people in this part of the world. Consequently, a proper understanding of the way science, technology, and innovation can help improve the general condition and well-being, both social and economic, in a sustainable manner it is extremely crucial. Of course, more than just that, there's a need to prioritize science and technology in development policies and follow through with efficient implementation towards ensuring benefit the society. Therefore, I hope that we can make the best of these opportunities provided by Bridges, the series of events, the sharing of knowledge and experience, exchange of ideas, dialogues and understanding of different perspectives on a wide range of topics towards building a progressive and knowledgeable society that can think and act to ensure societal well-being and a better future for everyone. Thank you very much. Salam on. Thank you, Yamaragiratu. Ladies and gentlemen, it now gives me great pleasure to call upon Yang Bahagir, Professor Dr. Dr. Sharifah Habsa, 
Vice Chancellor of University of Bangsa, Malaysia, to welcome and introduce Professor Kondi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Good morning. On behalf of the National University. Zain Khan Sayyid with Bahasa Inggris. On behalf of UKM, I take great pleasure in welcoming our very distinguished speaker, Professor Roger Conver, Nobel Laureate for Chemistry in 2006. To, uh, we welcome also the Honorable Dr. Dato Engineer Haji Ahmad Zaidi Laidi. The Deputy President of the Academy of Science of Malaysia. Of course, Mr. Uwe Marowitz, the Chairman of the International Peace Foundation. His Excellency, Dr. Donatus Quirk, Ambassador of Austria. All these distinguished guests, present today, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the International Peace Foundation for making this lecture possible at UPM. We are proud to co-host this Bridges Dialogue towards a culture of peace program. There are many reasons why UKM is proud to be part of this global initiative to bridge cultural divides and foster peace through academic dialogues. This initiative embodies our ideals of academics and students transcending the realm of academia in making a direct contribution to the betterment of society. Such links to the real world or society enhances the quality, social relevance and effectiveness of our educational and research programs which we tried to show in the video. The social engagement furthers another critical mission of our university, one that we call the cultural mission. In carrying out this mission, we put our resources in service of the community as active agents and partners in social change. Under the rubric of culture, we steer research and curricula to meet emerging societal needs to provide innovative ideas and practices for the solution of local problems, to improve the social importance of knowledge throughout the community, to educate, to develop the intellect, to imbibe values of responsible and productive citizenry, and to meet the challenges of multicultural societies and globalization. We do this in living up to our motto, as you saw on the video, of inspiring futures and nurturing possibilities, and in keeping the great talents in our UKM intact. More importantly, it is also in full cognizance of our role as a national university. Over time, we have kept national, not just Bahasa, which is expected to produce protect and inculcate the idea of national self-knowledge or culture and values. Apart from, from promoting Malay as an academic language, the cultural mission recognizes knowledge as the defining elements in the preservation and propagation of values such as responsibility, right and wrong, good and evil traditions, customs, experiences, meanings, beliefs, and material objects which cover the course of generations collectively to give us our identity or national self-knowledge. And our role in reconciling this cultural image of ourselves with the global quest for peace and understanding. In this quest, we hope to stimulate independent thinking and opinion making about societal issues such as hunger, health, poverty, social imbalance, climate change, environmental degradation, cultural divide, and conflicts. This morning, we are gathered to hear Professor Converse 
views on basic science, the hope of progress. UKM is honored to present this public intellectual. And we have taken the liberty to print a short biography of his illustrious career in the cutting edge field of molecular biology. Please do read it. His research epitomizes the kind of most important chemical discovery envisaged by Alfred Nobel in his will. From his discovery of the nucleus cell and his studies on how genetic information is copied from the DNA to RNA, Professor Conberg has further unlocked the mystery of life. Ever since DNA was first isolated in the mid-1800s and demonstrated as the double helix in the mid-20th century. This the deoxyribonucleic acid, as we know today, contains the genetic instructions used in the development and functioning of all known living organisms and some viruses. Professor Conberg has shown how information stored in the DNA segments of genes is passed on as instructions to construct other components of cells such as proteins and RNA molecules, as well as how this process is regulated or mediated. After hearing you were naturalized by the unconvinced Professor Convert and his father have mastered this process very well in winning the Nobel Prize. <laughs> More profoundly, Professor Conberg has shown the molecular basis of our similarities. We may be divided by geographical, cultural, and ideological boundaries, but our life processes are the same. It is not too late, and I, on behalf of the audience, take the opportunity to personally congratulate you for winning the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2006. more eminent than Professor Conver to speak on basic science, the hope of progress. Professor Conver. Uh, Madam Vice Chancellor, Mr. Morowitz, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm most grateful for this opportunity. I am uh, more than pleased to participate in this important Bridges program. Uh, it is uh, a pleasure to uh, visit for the first time uh, this country and this great university, and uh, I'm most appreciative for hospitality. In a, a recent contribution to Bridges, uh, the physicist Sheldon Glashow, you may have heard, uh, spoke elsewhere in the program, commented on the importance of basic science, which I know in the title. And I might point out, uh, I presented on this slide a shortened version of a longer title. Uh, I addressed the same subject that was originally proposed, and then, uh, this, as I say, is a kind of summary statement of the title. Sheldon Glashow commented on the importance of basic science, and in particular, of serendipity, of chance discovery for technological development and for benefits to uh, humankind. In his lecture, which you may read, he gave examples from physical science, and he described their impact, in particular, on engineering. I myself have often made similar arguments in relation to biomedical science, and it's more on human health. I would like to begin today with biomedical science, and then extend the discussion begun by uh, Professor Glashow along several lines uh, to include the following. The underlying reason and the indispensable nature of basic research. The meaning and the mechanism of serendipity, of chance discovery. The relationship of basic science to industry, to government and to society. Finally, 
the relationship of science and religion, which must be addressed in any such discussion, including the implications for cultural accommodation between peoples and ultimately peace, which is the purpose of the organization sponsoring this series. Now, let me make one disclaimer. I must emphasize at the outset, my expertise lies in a limited area of chemical and biomedical science. I'm not a social scientist, and my opinions on such matters are entirely personal. They may be of interest, perhaps even provocative, but they carry no more weight than those of any other member of this audience. <laughs> Let me begin with the history of biomedical science, uh, some of the important points that I'll make are summarized on the first slide. It may surprise you to know that medical science, as we understand it today, is only about 100 years old. Whereas physics and chemistry began centuries before, human biology was largely neglected. Human disease, until recently, was attributed to an imbalance of humors, and the treatments were bleeding and violent prayers. Doctors were not even educated men. Uh, with the first stirrings of medical science, uh, the president of Harvard at the time, Charles Elliott, proposed adding it to the curriculum of the medical school to which a noted surgeon in the medical school and the faculty of the time objected this would be impossible because few of his students could read or write. Today, medical science stands as a triumph of intellect and the greatest frontier for intellectual activity of the future. If the 20th century was the age of physics, then the 20th century is surely the age of biology and especially the age of human biology. Now this is not to diminish the ongoing importance of the physical sciences. Quite the contrary. The boundaries between scientific disciplines have largely disappeared. We have today a near continuum of science from the atomic level to that of the whole organism. This is a remarkable event that has taken place before our eyes and that we've barely noticed over the last half century, but we have all been present to witness it. We will one day understand every aspect of human life in chemical and in physical terms, and with that understanding will come control, control over disease, control over behavior, including tolerance and aggression, even control over aging and the future of the human race. Of course, how we exercise that control is a matter for everyone equally to decide. The past affords clear guidelines for fulfilling this great promise. If I were to ask you what were the major advances in medical science over the last hundred years to which I referred, most of you would come up with, about, with a similar, if not the same list. You would think of x-rays for diagnosis and treatment. You would think of antibiotics which have largely eradicated bacterial disease. You would think of non-invasive imaging, for example, magnetic resonance imaging or MRI for early detection of cancer and other conditions. Um, you would surely, most of you, mention genetic engineering, which is the basis of most new medicines. And the list would go on. All these medical advances have one thing in common. They were all discoveries made in the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake without any idea of an application with no notion of curing or preventing disease. The lesson of the past is therefore counterintuitive. It tells us to solve a difficult problem in medical science, don't attempt to do so. Don't study it directly. Rather, pursue a curiosity about nature and the rest will follow. Do basic research. I think it's instructive to examine a couple of the examples that I've given, x-rays and antibiotics in more detail. Um, what one learns from the history of these particular examples is particularly illuminating. X-rays were discovered by Wilhelm Röntgen. If you will turn to the next slide, please. X-rays were discovered by Röntgen, the only child of a textile merchant and a manufacturer in the Netherlands in the 19th century. 
At age 18, he was permanently expelled from school for refusing to inform on a classmate who'd drawn a caricature of a teacher. And he was never allowed to attend another school in the Netherlands or in Germany again for that offense. He nevertheless, because of his great ability and his passion for science, went on to an academic career. Eventually became chair in physics at the University of Woodsburg, where in 1895, he was investigating the external effects of passing an electrical discharge through a cathode ray tube. And he just happened to notice a faint shimmering on a fluorescent screen elsewhere in his laboratory. He saw that that faint shimmering uh, little hint of light on the fluorescent screen was present even if the cathode ray tube was completely draped in black hardware or cloth. And he realized that a new kind of rays emanating from this tube must be responsible, and he named them X-rays. Actually, at the time, everyone else called them rendered rays. But being the modest man that he was, he insisted on the name X-rays. <laughs> After that, he investigated what kind of material might block the rays emanating from the tube. He held various materials in front of the tube for the purpose, and then saw on the fluorescent screen an image of the skeleton of his own hand. This, of course, led to the immediate medical application of this basic discovery in physics. Within a year or two, it was already in widespread medical use. And in 1901, Rentgen was awarded the first Nobel Prize in physics. Now let me turn again very briefly to the history of antibiotics. Many of you will have heard the famous story of Alexander Fleming and the discovery of penicillin. You may not know, however, that it was a previous chance finding made by Fleming that formed the basis for the discovery of penicillin, and moreover, that he never pursued the medical application of penicillin. Now, Fleming was a professor of bacteriology at St. Mary's Hospital in London, and he was growing bacteria that caused disease to investigate uh, what might be used to prevent uh, their growth and proliferation. He was growing them in a dish, and one day he had a cold and a drop from his nose fell into the dish, and it killed the bacteria. <coughs> he traced that effect to a protein in this drop that fell from his nose, a protein called lysosome that destroys the cell walls of bacteria. Um, this gave him the idea that there might be natural materials that could be used to combat uh, disease-causing bacterial growth. Unfortunately, lysosome is not useful for that purpose. But this did prepare his mind for the possibility, which was realized six years later in 1928, when he noticed that a mold growing on one of his dishes had also killed the bacteria in the dish. He named the active agent secreted by the mold penicillin, but he was unable to isolate it. He gave up, he wrote a paper describing his findings that was published and soon forgotten. A decade later at Oxford, Howard Florey and Ernst Chain were investigating lysosome and its target, the bacterial cell wall. They wanted to learn about the nature of lysosome and its action upon the target. Florey had similar humble beginnings to Rentkin. He was the son of a shoemaker in Australia. He came to England on a Rhodes Scholarship and rose through the ranks to become director of the Sir William Dunn School of Pathology in Oxford. Ernst Chain was a refugee from Nazi Germany and a musical as well as a scientific genius. And he was Florey's first hire in the school that Florey became, came to direct at Oxford. The two together, who had a somewhat troubled relationship, both being temperamental in nature, could agree on one point. And that was that they should extend their study of lysosome to what they believed to be other lysosomes, antibacterial agents coming from a variety of organisms. For example, penicillin. A chain, as it turned out, had a near photographic memory. He could remember everything he read, and when they made this decision, he could recall having seen the paper by Fleming that everyone else had forgotten. So they thought they would investigate penicillin, as I say, believing it to be a lysosome. Soon, Chain succeeded where Fleming had failed in isolating the material, discovered it was not a protein, it was not lysozyme, it was 
a small chemical that could serve an important therapeutic purpose. And he and Flurry demonstrated its value by studies on mice. But there remained the problem of obtaining sufficient quantities for human use. Uh, and this was an enormous challenge, which was eventually surrounded by the collaboration of literally dozens of institutions, universities, government agencies, research foundations, and pharmaceutical companies, all working together in the late, late 1940s and early 50s uh, to finally uh, realize the potential of penicillin for its therapeutic application. The result, as I have said, was the virtual eradication of bacterial disease, and for this achievement, Fleming, Flory, and Chain shared the 1945 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Now, these brief accounts that I have given you of the history of X-rays and antibiotics serve, first of all, I think, to reinforce the crucial role of basic research. They also illuminate this process of discovery. We can move to the next slide. Work leading to discoveries is invariably done by individuals. Individuals free to explore and follow the path of science wherever it may lead. All such paths lead ultimately to underlying principles, to fundamental truths of nature. And it is from this knowledge, from deep understanding, that practical benefit ultimately derives. Discovery is the engine of progress. Discovery and its offspring, technology, are all that separate us from our original primitive condition. Discovery is the hope of progress, the hope for advancement in the future. Now, the importance of discovery for medical, economic, and even military benefit has not been lost on central planners. The problem is that discoveries, by their nature, can't be planned. They arise, as I've told you, from untargeted research. They arise by what Sheldon Glashow in his remarks referred to as serendipity. Beautifully illustrated by the work of Rankin, by Fleming, and by others. The only way to assure a flow of discoveries that will benefit us all is by the support of talented individuals everywhere, including at this university and elsewhere in the world, in the unfettered pursuit of knowledge. This important lesson of the past, so well established by the experience of the past century, is often forgotten by people in government and industry who desire greater, more immediate financial and other gain. I can recall the words uh, from quite some time ago when I was a young person of the American president at the time, Lyndon Johnson, who lamented what he called life-saving life discoveries locked up in the laboratory, and he pleaded for more translational research. This serious sentiment was mistaken. Application of existing knowledge is not the limiting factor in solving our problems. The knowledge itself is limited. As an example, it's been remarked that we know about 1% of all of human biology. In fact, the truth is we know less than that tiny fraction of 1%, and I can easily demonstrate that to you in quantitative terms. Point is, that tiny fraction of knowledge of human biology has an enormous benefit to our health, as we've just discussed, to our economy, economies worldwide. Imagine how great would be the benefits of knowing the remaining 99.9%. Another lesson from the past, if you will change the slide, relates to the support of basic research. This has traditionally come from governments <coughs> rather than from industry, and for a good reason. The timeline is very long. Fundamental problems, the kinds of discoveries to which I alluded, take decades. Only the public, with a long-range interest in bettering the human condition, will support an undertaking on that time scale. Industry with a short term interest in the bottom line can hardly be expected to do so. What CEO could report to his or her board that a major investment has been made in research that may or may not become profitable in 20 years or longer? Impossible. Now, let me give you a concrete, very recent, and I would say even a frightening example. It's a true example. I 
have it on good authority. Pharmaceutical companies today developing anti-cancer therapies are regularly, on a weekly basis, forced to choose between a drug that will cure cancer with a single dose and a drug that must be administered weekly and prolongs life for only a year or two. Management always makes the right decision on behalf of shareholders and pursues the less effective drug. This is not an isolated example. Again, I am told by the best oncologists in the world this happens on a weekly basis. Government clearly has a special responsibility and a unique role to play. The return on investment by government in basic research has been huge. The eradication of polio, the cure of childhood leukemia, and many of these have not only saved vast amounts in treatment and productivity, not to mention human suffering. The investment has been paid, repaid many, many times over. The investment was even very small to begin with. The annual budget for cancer research in the United States today is $5 billion, less than 10% of the annual expenditure on soft drinks. Less than a week, uh, uh, the, the less, less than one week of the cost of the lamentable war in Iraq. <laughs> now you, in this audience, um, others in very many places around the world may ask, why not wait for a large country like the United States with its rich government to fund basic research, publish the new knowledge, and then benefit? Why shouldn't smaller countries like Malaysia or Thailand or many other places that I visited where there are also very fine universities around the world concentrate on applications that have particular economic or unfortunately in many cases military or other value? The answer is the importance of leadership. Those who create new knowledge will lead and most benefit from its application. Now, to me, the most obvious example examples are high tech and biotech, both of which began next door to where I live, uh, near the uh, next door to the universities in the San Francisco Bay Area, where the discoveries that led to uh, these technologies were made. Others around the world have joined in the rewards to a very great extent, but the leaders have been vastly, vastly more economically and otherwise successful. Not only in the past, but I'm afraid also in the future, and that is because not of the discoveries, not of the knowledge, not of the existing technology, but of the people, because of the talent that drives the enterprise. The best and the brightest still come to train in the San Francisco Bay Area, and many of them will remain after attracted, um, sometimes after having trained elsewhere. It is crucial for other places, other countries, to compete, to retain their native talent, and to recruit from abroad as well. A marketplace for talent is in the best interests of all. A market for the employment of young scientists is of particular importance, not only to retain their talent, but even to encourage them to do science in the first place. The choice of a career in science represents a great sacrifice. A passion for science must be weighed against a long period of training, 10 years of postgraduate study at low wages, the possibility, I'm afraid, of no career at the end. <laughs> the importance of young scientists cannot be overstated. Progress in science and discovery in particular is the work of young minds. Now, the marketplace for talent uh, to which I've alluded is both academic and industrial. And I should say, by emphasizing the crucial role of government in the support of science, I don't mean to diminish the importance of industry. I've already noted the vital contribution made by pharmaceutical companies in the development of penicillin. This is not an isolated or a rare example, but rather an, illustrated, an illustration of a time-honored process industry has been and will remain primarily responsible for translating discoveries made in academic laboratories into commercially viable technologies. The time scale for industrial development may be small, but the financial scale is certainly not small. A pharmaceutical company will invest hundreds of millions of dollars in the improvement and testing of a single drug to gain regulatory approval. Now if I may have the next slide. Basic science may be 
I'm sure all for practical problems, but what possible relevance does it have to social issues, questions of human rights, international peace, of other things that concern us so much in the world today? On one level, of, I mean, let me simply state the obvious. You can read it in very many lectures written by others, and I won't belabor the point. The practice of science is truly an example of international cooperation. A majority of the young scientists in my own laboratory over the years, a majority have come from Europe and Israel, from Asia, and from Central and South America. And my laboratory is no exception. The findings made by these young people um, and indeed by everyone in science, are published in a worldwide scientific literature. It's available for everyone to read, to criticize, and eventually to exploit. <clears throat> now, to turn beyond that obvious point, um, it is often remarked, and it is true, that education is important to combat hatred, intolerance, and other afflictions in society. But education in general, and scientific knowledge in particular, is not enough. Um, it turns out not to be the uh, universal prescription for social ills. The most learned society, perhaps in the history of mankind, that of 20th century Germany, perpetrated, as you know, the worst defense against humanity, the Holocaust. More than half of those who planned the mass murder of the Jews at the Wannsee Conference in 1941 held doctoral degrees. The product of scholarship, including science, will not alone protect us from such atrocities in the future. Rather, I believe it is the culture of science and of intellectual activity in general that may serve as a paradigm, at least, for addressing societal problems. Science seeks fundamental principles, as I have told you, and scientific truth, at least, is universal. In an analogous fashion, societies are sustained by the rule of law, whose application depends on an unbiased judiciary. As I say, an analogous state. In a world such as ours, beset by irrational forces, science truly represents the light of reason. And the rule of law has been viewed since ancient times in a similar way. Sandra Day O'Connor, formerly a justice on the American Supreme Court, wrote recently, but the belief of Aristotle, if you could change to the next slide, she quoted the belief of Aristotle that the rule of law is nothing less than the rule of reason, balanced by considerations of equity, so that just results may be achieved in particular cases. Alexander Hamilton, I think you should go to the next slide because I got them out of order here, and then we'll back up. Alexander Hamilton. Uh, who was a soldier in the American War of Independence in the uh, 18th century and an architect of the American Constitution once wrote, a steady, upright, and impartial administration of laws is essential because no man can be sure he may not tomorrow be the victim of a spirit of injustice by which he may be the gainer today. Science may not solve the world's social problems, but the culture of science, the pursuit of universal truth, can at least serve as a model for doing so. Now, if you go back to the previous slide, um, I can't uh, remark on the pursuit of truth without addressing um, the relationship between science and religion. The pursuit of truth underlying the human condition is older than Aristotle. Both Eastern and Western religion are founded on fundamental principles, very similar ones. Uh, the precepts of Buddhism, for example, or the Ten Commandments of Judaism is another example. Beyond such a foundation on principle, both science and religion, as we all know, have as their purpose explaining the fundamental mysteries of our existence and of our universe. Their purposes are very similar, though the conclusions reached are often very different. But what is remarkable is that we seek knowledge of all, that we feel impelled to do so. We will expend an enormous effort to do so. We'll take mortal risks and endure great suffering, great suffering, uh, to gain knowledge. An obvious example is the exploration of earthly and outer space. Another would be the creation of art and literature. An urge to explore is a part of our nature. Both science and religion uh, serve as perfect illustrations of this. 
that this urge to explore was a major factor in the evolution of our species. And the goal is testing the limits of the possible and of the knowledge that lies beyond. The rewards, of course, are primarily personal. Clearly, we possess an inherent desire to know and urge to understand, an urge that is common to science and religion, and that is truly an expression of our human spirit. I told you it's the overarching purpose of basic research, but now I emphasize that it's deeply ingrained. I believe it's more powerful than greed or lust or other motivations. It's led to life as we know it. And though sometimes a source of evil, it can be more often beneficial. I've already mentioned the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake is vital for our future, um, because it's the source of progress. A second reason for the pursuit of knowledge, which I would emphasize now, is the intrinsic value of intellectual activity. Truth does have a certain objective purity. Now, I can't conclude without remarking the urge to understand, common between science and religion, and so fundamental to human activity has been encouraged by great success. As others have remarked, no human capability is more remarkable than that of unraveling the mysteries of our existence, including our very capabilities themselves. Now, we don't know how far these capabilities will extend. Already, our explanations have gone, gone beyond simple reason. Cosmology, chemistry, biology um, can only be understood in the deepest sense in terms of abstract ideas. Um, these are the great abstractions that many of you will know from modern science of energy, of scale, and of time. The behavior of matter at high energy is treated in terms of relativity, not a straightforward concept at all. The nature of matter on the atomic scale, the basis of chemistry, is described in terms of quantum mechanics, also not a component or something accessible in everyday life. And finally, in biology, the evolution of the species is a reflection of vast time geologic term. And I can best illustrate the nature of this particular extraction with an example from my own research, which I'll tell you very briefly. As you've heard uh, from the Vice Chancellor, my studies have been on genetic information. And I think probably most of you know that genetic information, our genes perform a dual role. They're both a repository of information that is passed from parents to offspring, and they're at the same time a source of information used to direct the activity of every living thing in every generation. Now, the first step in the use of the genetic information is reading that information, and that's accomplished by a giant assemblage of protein molecules. My colleagues and I at Stanford University over the years obtained an image, an actual picture, of this assemblage of protein molecules in the very act of reading the genetic information. The image shows the location of every one of the 30,000 atoms involved in the process. What we realize when we study this image, what we see is a minute machine with moving parts, what we refer to as a clamp, jaws, rudder, lid, trigger. It's a marvel of natural engineering. Its intricacy, its efficiency, are scarcely imaginable in terms of evolution, and yet it did arise by evolution over a period of vast time. Now finally, it may be thought that understanding fundamental processes in this way, and grasping, for example, the power of geologic time, somehow diminishes the wonders of nature. But on the contrary, one is truly awestruck by the beauty and the grandeur of all. This sense of awe can evoke a spiritual response um, as Einstein once wrote, and shown on this quotation from him on the last of the series of slides, the most beautiful emotion, Einstein said, that we can experience is the mysterious. It is the fundamental emotion that stands at the cradle of all true art and science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger, who can no longer wonder and stand wrapped in awe, is as good as dead, a snuffed out candle. The sense that behind anything that can be experienced, there is something that our minds, minds cannot grasp, whose beauty and sublimity reaches us only indirectly. This is religiousness, and in this sense, and in this sense only, I'm a religious man. This same sense of awe can engender a belief in the power of reason. 
Many of us engaged in work such as I've described share the conviction all mysteries of nature will ultimately succumb to explanation, as I have told you at the outset, in chemical, in chemical and physical terms. Of course, we can't know that this is so. It's an article of faith. Uh, science, like religion, is powered by faith. An article of faith which will continue to be tested for as long as we endure. If the pursuit of understanding reflects a primal urge, as I have mentioned, the satisfaction to be gained from it is not less important. The pursuit of science is a great joy. <coughs> and an important key to success in science is the sheer love of it, which is not to say the work is always fun. Um, it's more often a struggle than most things we do fail. But occasional progress is exhilarating. It's rewarding, and it leads us on. So in all of its aspects of faith, of passion, the quest for larger meaning, science resembles religion. At the deepest level, both science and religion are, as I've said, reflections of our humanity. Where science departs from religion, of course, is its foundation upon objective, verifiable truth. And that is one thing in particular that I believe science offers to society. Finally, I'll summarize with the next slide using uh, the language of this gathering. Science is a literal bridge to the understanding of nature and to practical benefits and to the personal fulfillment that I have told you inevitably follows. Basic science is at the same time a figurative bridge to the solution of societal problems through, ex through the example it sets of rationality, the rule of law, and impartiality, an unbiased judiciary. Science leads directly to technological progress. The culture of science may lead, although indirectly, to progress towards peace and understanding without 